First of all, we're going to look at the element silicon, although other semiconducting materials are available. Silicon has the symbol SI and an atomic number of 14. This means that silicon atoms contain 14 electrons. Two in the first shell, eight in the next, then four in the outer shell. We refer to these outer electrons as valence electrons. These are the electrons which can form chemical bonds. Now we'll simplify our model of the silicon atom to show only the four outer valence electrons which take part in bonding. In individual atoms, the electrons can only occupy discrete energy levels. The production of line emission spectra and line absorption spectra can be explained in terms of the electrons moving to different energy levels and either emitting or absorbing a photon, although that's covered in another lesson. When a large number of atoms come together to form a solid, the energy levels become reorganised into bands as the atoms interact. Each energy band actually consists of many, many closely spaced energy levels. You can see from the diagram on the left that all four of the silicon atoms' outer electrons form covalent bonds with the neighbouring atoms. Now, out of interest, the diagram on the left shows what's known as the semiconductor bonding model. At zero Kelvin, all of the outer electrons are bonded. The diagram on the right shows the energy band model. In order to explain the electrical properties of semiconductors, we only need to consider two energy bands, the valence band and the conduction band. These are separated by a band gap, which we'll discuss later. What I've not mentioned yet is that this is an undoped semiconductor of pure silicon, what we call an intrinsic semiconductor. As I said before, at zero Kelvin, all the outer electrons are bonded. Let's look at what happens when we add some heat. So, an electron has gained enough energy to break the covalent bond and is now free to take part in conduction, meaning that the resistance of the material is reduced. The absence of the negatively charged electron in this position leaves behind a net positive charge, which we call a hole. In terms of energy bands, the electron, which was initially in the valence band, jumps to the conduction band, leaving behind a hole in the valence band. The band gap, or energy gap, is just the energy required for the electron to break the covalent bond and jump into the conduction band. As the semiconductor is further heated, more covalent bonds are broken, resulting in more electrons jumping to the conduction band, with more positive holes created in the valence band. So as the temperature of a semiconductor increases, its resistance decreases, due to the motion of the electrons in the conduction band and holes in the valence band. If we look at the diagram on the left, we can see that electrons from neighbouring atoms can move to fill a hole, leaving behind a hole in their previous position. Although strictly this was caused by the motion of negative electrons from left to right, we can also describe it as the motion of positive holes from right to left. Next, we'll look at energy bands in a little more detail. As I said before, we only need to consider the valence band and the conduction band in order to explain the electrical properties of semiconductors, and for that matter, conductors and insulators. Remember then, that in order for a material to conduct, it must have electrons which are free to move within its conduction band, or holes in its valence band. In a conductor, conduction can actually be explained by considering only the conduction band. The conduction band is only partially filled, so electrical conduction is permitted. Unlike a semiconductor though, increasing the temperature of a metal conductor will actually cause its resistance to increase. This is because the number of electrons within the conduction band increases so much that they have less freedom of movement. Remember that in a conductor, the highest occupied energy band, the conduction band, is not completely full. In insulators, there's a very large band gap between the top of the valence band and the bottom of the conduction band. At zero Kelvin, the valence band is completely full and the conduction band is completely empty. At higher temperatures, electrons don't normally gain enough energy to jump from the valence band to the conduction band. So with no electrons in the conduction band, conduction isn't possible. For an insulator then, the highest occupied energy band, the valence band, is full. Finally, semiconductors have a very narrow band gap between the valence band and the conduction band. Like insulators, at zero Kelvin the valence band is completely full and the conduction band is completely empty. But since the band gap is so small, as temperature rises, some electrons can gain enough energy to jump from the valence band to the conduction band, leaving behind holes in the valence band. 
As temperature increases then, the resistance of the semiconductor is reduced. Next on the agenda is doping. Here on the left, we see the bonding model of an intrinsic semiconductor, silicon again. With the addition of impurity atoms during the manufacture of the semiconductor, we can reduce its resistance. This is done in one of two ways. By doping with a group 5 impurity atom, such as arsenic as shown here, we end up with an extra electron. The energy level of this fifth electron is within the band gap, just below the conduction band. The energy levels associated with the extra electrons are known as donor levels. Even at room temperature, most of these electrons will gain enough energy to jump into the conduction band, thus reducing the resistance of the semiconductor. We call this an n-type semiconductor since the majority of conduction is due to the negative electrons within the conduction band. Remember that we previously discussed the heating of an intrinsic semiconductor. For each electron which jumped from the valence band to the conduction band, there was one hole left behind in the valence band. This meant that in an intrinsic semiconductor, electrons and holes exist in equal number. When we dope the semiconductor, however, this is no longer the case. In an n-type semiconductor, the majority of charge carriers are electrons, and holes, which are still present due to the process described earlier, will be very much in the minority. Despite the majority charge carriers being negative electrons, an n-type semiconductor is still electrically neutral, since the impurity atom, arsenic in this case, will have an equal number of electrons and protons. Now let's look at the p-type semiconductors. This time the impurity atom, or dopant, is from group 3, so only three outer electrons are available for bonding with the surrounding silicon atoms. This results in a positive hole, as shown. The impurity atom in the diagram, in case you are wondering, is indium. The addition of group 3 impurity atoms leads to additional energy levels in the band gap, just above the valence band. These are known as acceptor levels. Electrons in the valence band require very little energy to move to the acceptor levels, leaving behind holes in the valence band. This is where p-type semiconductors get their name, because the majority charge carriers are positive holes. Conduction in a p-type semiconductor is due to the motion of these positive holes within the valence band. Again, p-type semiconductors are electrically neutral, since the impurity atoms have an equal number of electrons and protons. So, that's us for now. In the next lesson, I'll be discussing the formation of a p-n junction and how it performs when forward or reverse biased. The diagram on the left shows a semiconductor crystal, which is doped so that one side, the left-hand side, is p-type, and the other, the right-hand side, is n-type. Remember from the first video that the majority of charge carriers in a p-type semiconductor are positive holes, and in an n-type semiconductor, the majority of charge carriers are negative electrons. Despite this, both are electrically neutral. Where the p-type and n-type regions meet is known as a p-n junction. Here, electrons from the n-type material move across the junction and combine with holes from the p-type and vice versa. This is a process known as diffusion, which creates a region within the semiconductor known as the depletion layer. The depletion layer is, effectively, an insulator due to the lack of majority charge carriers within it. The p-type region within the depletion layer now has a net negative charge due to the electrons diffusing into it from the n-type material. Similarly, the n-type region has a net positive charge due to the holes diffusing into it from the p-type material. Because of this, a potential difference is set up between the ends of the depletion layer, known as the junction voltage or potential barrier, which opposes the flow of further charges across the junction. In order for the p-n junction to conduct, this junction voltage must be overcome. Now let's turn our attention to the diagram on the right. Here we can see the energy band model of p-type semiconductor, where conduction is due to the motion of positive holes within the valence band, and n-type semiconductor, where conduction is due to the motion of negative electrons within the conduction band. When a p-n junction is formed, the energy bands warp like so. The region in the middle is the depletion layer. Fully explaining the energy band model of a p-n junction goes well beyond higher physics, so I'll not attempt it here. You can see though that the conduction band in the n-type has been lowered, and the valence band in the p-type has been raised. This is the electrical symbol for a p-n junction diode. We'll learn how it can be made to conduct when forward biased, but 
Before that, I should explain that this side, known as the cathode, is the n-type side, and this side, the anode, is the p-type side. Let's forward bias it then. To do that, we can connect the negative terminal of a battery to the n-type side, and the positive terminal to the p-type side. This has the effect of narrowing the depletion layer, and if the forward bias voltage is greater than the junction voltage, then the PN junction will conduct. When looking at the energy band model on the right, you've possibly noticed that when compared with the unbiased PN junction, the slope in the depletion layer is reduced. This makes it easier for electrons to flow from N-type to P-type across the barrier, and similarly for holes to flow from P-type to N-type. So, when forward biased, electrons within the conduction band of the N-type semiconductor move towards the conduction band of the P-type. Holes within the valence band of the P-type also move towards the valence band of the N-type. Within the junction, electrons drop from the conduction band to the valence band and recombine with holes. Energy is released during these recombinations and, in a PN junction diode, this is in the form of heat, which results in a rise in temperature. To reverse bias the PN junction, we connect the negative terminal of a battery to the P-type side and the positive terminal to the N-type side. This has the effect of widening the depletion layer and, when looking at the energy band model on the right, the slope in the depletion layer is far steeper. When the PN junction is reverse biased like this, the depletion layer has become a greater barrier to the movement of electrons from N-type to P-type and holes from P-type to N-type. There's almost no conduction apart from a very small current known as the reverse leakage current due to the motion of minority charge carriers. The PN junction diode then displays asymmetric conductance. Don't worry, this isn't a term you have to learn. What it means though is that the PN junction diode has a high conductance when the current is in one direction when forward biased and an extremely low conductance when current is in the opposite direction when reverse biased. This can be seen in the following graph of current against voltage. When forward biased, the supply voltage has to increase above the junction voltage before there's any noticeable increase in current as the forward biased PN junction conducts. When reverse biased, as mentioned earlier, the current is extremely small and the PN junction is effectively acting as an insulator. The symbol for an LED is the same as the PN junction diode except for one thing, these two arrows pointing outwards, which signify the light being emitted or released. Now, we saw in the last video how a PN junction operates when forward biased. It's important to remember then that an LED is basically just a PN junction which emits light when forward biased. That is, when the negative terminal of a battery is connected to the N-type side and the positive terminal to the P-type side. Normally, LEDs are protected from large currents by placing a resistor in series with them, but I've not included that in this diagram. The design of an LED is actually quite fascinating. Within an LED of diameter 5 mm, that's a fairly common size of LED, the semiconductor die is only a fraction of a millimetre in width. It sits within a tiny reflecting cup, which ensures that the light is reflected in the desired direction. The device is contained within an epoxy case, which also acts as a lens. Now, here's the important thing we need to know for higher physics. When the LED is forward biased, electrons within the conduction band of the N-type semiconductor move towards the conduction band of the P-type. Also, holes within the valence band of the P-type move towards the valence band of the N-type. Within the junction, electrons drop from the conduction band to the valence band and recombine with holes. When an electron recombines with a hole, a photon of light is emitted, as shown in the animation. Now, you might have a question which asks you to calculate the wavelength or frequency of the light emitted by the LED. This depends on the band gap. That's the energy between the valence band and the conduction band. To calculate the photon's frequency, we just use this equation, where E is the band gap in joules, H is Planck's constant, which is found in the data sheet at the front of the exam, and F is frequency in hertz. To calculate wavelength, we then use the wave equation, V equals F lambda, where V is the speed of light in air, 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second, again in the data sheet. F is frequency, and lambda is wavelength in meters. If you're asked to determine the actual colour of the light emitted by the LED, 
then all you have to do is to compare your calculated wavelength with those given in the datasheet. Next up is the solar cell. Before I talk about the solar cell, I'd like to mention this component, the photodiode. Like the solar cell, it's an example of what's called a photovoltaic device. The photodiode has two modes of operation. Firstly, when reverse biased, remember that's connecting the negative terminal of a battery to the P-type side and the positive terminal to the N-type side. The photodiode operates in the photoconductive mode. Now we don't need to know about this in higher physics, so I'll go straight on to the second mode of operation, photovoltaic. You'll see from the diagram that in photovoltaic mode, the photodiode is not biased. In other words, it's not connected to a power supply. When light shines on the photodiode, energy from a photon of light can excite an electron from the valence band into the conduction band, creating an EMF. This is the basis for how solar cells operate, so let's see it in action. Looking at the circuit diagram, you'll see the symbol for a solar cell with a voltmeter connected across it to measure the output voltage or EMF. The question is though, how does it work? So, when a photon of energy greater than the band gap of the semiconductor strikes the PN junction, it can excite an electron from the valence band into the conduction band. You'll have seen that a hole is also left in the valence band. The electron moves to the conduction band of the N-type and the hole moves to the valence band of the P-type. The separation of the charges creates an EMF. This is known as the photovoltaic effect. If the light source was moved closer to the solar cell, then a greater number of photons would strike the solar cell per second, resulting in a greater separation of charges as more electron-hole pairs are produced. A greater EMF would therefore be measured in the voltmeter. 